Welcome to the second video of the J-Swap Fiero. In the first video, we went over quickly what we were doing and it was thrown together on the cell phone. This one we'll put a little more production value into. I'll give you a nice voiceover of what it is I'm doing uh, and talk about plans and then answer the questions at the end about one, why am I doing it instead of just like the 3800 supercharged, what my goals for the car are, and um, you know any other questions that I keep seeing in comments. All right, so the next step is to get it off this trailer, turn it around, throw it in the garage. Here my dad's helping. Um, why not rip the bumper off while we're at it? So I, we turned it around, put it in the garage. Mostly I include this to prove that it runs. This is a $500 car and I am so happy with my purchase. My kids naturally jump in the way to try and get run over. That's just part of being a parent. Now that the car is in the bay, we can go ahead and start removing it. Here I'm removing the intake box and fumbling around off camera, trying to take out the battery tray. The battery was actually held in place with a Cap 5 cable, which, um, yeah, quality. Now we're taking out the radiator. Uh, everything must go here. You know, we're just pulling it out and we're not putting it back in. But we're trying to be careful with parts. Hopefully we can resell them. Taking off these lower radiator hoses. And then we're just cleaning up and continuing to fight that battery tray. By the end of the day, we've ended with a pretty sizable chunk of work done. And come back the next day. Hopefully today we can get the engine ripped out of this thing. We're disconnecting any lines we can find. And then lifting the car up so we can crawl underneath and see what all is going on. These uh, motor mounts fought me quite a bit, especially the rear motor mount. And the one on the power steering side of the engine is actually sheared completely off. Every single bushing in this car is absolutely shredded. So now we have to remove the lower suspension, at least remove the upper control arm so that we can get some play in our CV shafts, pop them out, because when we lift the car, the CV shafts are going to have to come out of the motor. Now, this uh, driver's side was super easy to do. I could get in there with a crowbar. Passenger side was a little tougher. Um, I had to keep lifting the car up higher so I could get a bigger crowbar in there. But eventually, I did pop it out. All right. We have separated, if we can see, our CV axle. It's not all the way out, but as we go up, we can slide it from the intermediary shaft. That was the hard part. Now, I'm going to take off those two lower transmission mounts and uh, I think that's it from under oh I need to zip off the uh, the exhaust real quick I believe I said I'd zip off the exhaust real quick famous last words all right we got okay we've got the down pipes unbolted with a nice little breaker bar now I can't get the secondary cat off, um, but it's a project car. I hate exhaust. So we choose our battles and the exhaust gets to stay in the car. I hook up the engine hoist and I go ahead and remove the bolts to all of the engine mounts and then do the awkward shuffle trying to get it high enough and make sure I have everything disconnected while I raise the engine little by little. I don't know about you but I never get everything disconnected. Here you can see I'm really fighting that back engine mount and then as I start going up I will notice that I actually left the clutch line intact so I go ahead and cut that off because it's not going back in. All right, taking off time lapse. The engine is coming out. These guys, little ratcheting things, awesome for cutting heater hoses and stuff you don't care about. So, I am doing this at my dad's house, and that's about a 30 minute drive from my house. Oh, like this thing. And I work a you full day that. of work, and then you know. take the kids, bring them over to my that parents' house, and try and do this while also watching the kids. Listen to my slightly delusional banter, it's the end of the day, and I am just trying to rip this out and go home. Shit. I don't know how to remove...
think this back motor breaks. But it's causing problems. Nothing more elevation can't fix. So here, again, I'm tired. I don't have the chain really secured. It's just kind of resting on the top of this engine hoist that's off screen. And uh, yeah, that could have ended poorly. Um, luckily, I didn't break anything. So I wrapped the chain a few times, make sure it's secure on there. That also gives me a little more elevation to pull this thing out and over that radiator support. I could also go down with the car, but again, I'm trying to do this fast and perhaps not entirely right. I'm ready to go. Now, because we wrapped the chain, it wants to spin, which sucks. There we have it. We have the Honda J30A4 pulled out, looking old, ready to go into that guy. Um, obviously, I'm going to take it apart. We're going to get a new water belt, water pump, timing belt. Um, alternator is going to stay there, but we're going to get a belt that fits it. No AC, no power steering. Um, we're going to freshen up everything over here, and while we're doing that, we're going to disassemble it and take some parts home to, uh, to work on throughout the week, and then um, also triple check our measurements for our suspension and start mocking that up. All right, one of the comments that I got was, good luck fitting that big of a motor in. Um, it's still a 60 degree V, not a 90 degree V. Uh, it does have single overhead cams, which gives it a little height, but as you can see, the intake manifold on this is uh, pretty big, so let's measure. So from back of the housing-ish to front, we're at 24 inches, and I always wanted to know this when I was uh, doing the engine swap, which is half the reason I'm doing the video. So loosely from the bottom of the oil pan, all right, we can see where you are about level. We're looking at uh, 29, 29 inches to the top. And then coming across, we're going to go at the widest-ish point. Sorry for the handy cam work. God, I'm old. People don't know what handy cams are. Uh, from that side, this side, once again, we're like 22, 23 Call it 24 inches to be safe because up in front these accessories stick out a little bit. So we're 24 by 24 by 28. Let's go measure this guy. Nice and easy across the front. Uh, we'll take the mufflers into account. So we are a little wider. We're uh, lined up. It's coming out to about 27, 28 inches including that exhaust manifold, but that's okay. We had a lot of room in the car. Uh, from the oil pan to the top. And this is the this is the one I can't fudge because it'll ruin the deck. We are, again, uh, oil pan is resting on that. And that's why I'm going there. We're actually a little shorter, like 27, 28 inches. So almost identical. We're actually shorter. We're substantially shorter so looking from there to about there uh, I did take some accessories off so let's give it benefit of the doubt and you know 23 24 inches uh, however the Fiero engine bay is well known for fitting like the LS4 which is two more cylinders you know tacked onto the end so we have plenty of room to stuff this guy in there it is gonna be a little bit 
wider filling up the bay. So then the next question that's always asked, why go J series instead of the L67 or L32, which is the 3.8 liter supercharged Buick motor comes in a variety of boats um, up until mid 2000s. It does share a bell housing. However, you do have to get, um, you know, a new flywheel and a new clutch. That's another 500 bucks into the build where I can use this stock one for now. If you, if you look up Fierro's online, you can see that there's been everything inside of it. Matt Farah drove a 4G63 um, turbocharged Fiero. There's K-swapped Fieros. There's Audi V8 Fieros. There is every Fiero swap you have ever seen, except a J-Series. Uh, so that'd be kind of cool. A little internet clout to uh, put the first running one in there. But really what it comes down to is looking for a manufacturer that is still current and has a strong aftermarket. ZZ Performance, ZZP Performance, uh, does provide aftermarket for the L67. But I uh, I don't know. I really like you know the Honda aftermarket. I before have had several DSMs, and I really like just being able to buy parts, right? Buy pistons, buy things from multiple vendors, and not just um, be stuck with like buying Fiero stuff that is slowly getting depreciated and is no longer available. Uh, when looking at an engine, I was all over the place. For a while, I was pretty convinced I was going to go like EJ25 and turbocharged, but I felt like my goals for the car is to really just beat on it um, and not just be, you know, a horsepower queen. Um, so the EJ transmission seemed a little weak for the power goals, which is like, 250, 300, um, starting out. And obviously I, I always will want to go up. Uh, so then, you know, I was also thinking like the easy 30, um, which is the Subaru horizontally opposed six cylinder, uh, pretty similar power output as the J 30, um, from Honda. Uh, but you cannot buy an easy 30 with a manual transmission. You have to like mix and match that with the Subaru Legos. So, um, I was looking around and ended up wanting to go J series. It made the most sense to me looking it up. Uh, Wikipedia says it runs at like a running J 30, a four is about 250 pounds. seems a little light. You know, I, I bet it's, you know, 320, but the running L 67 is about 450 pounds. So we're saving a hundred, 150 pounds just off the engine alone. Then we're going to get this transmission. Uh, transmission actually has aftermarket. Fiero transmission is pretty garbage. Um, any amount of torque kind of breaks it. You can do the uh, F40 transmission, which is a six speed transmission that came out. I heard those are pretty weak too, but they're a six speed and they're they're fancy. Uh, and then the F23 is what I think Fiero owners who are putting down power and staying manual uh, really end up running. However, all of that is aftermarket cost, fabrication costs. You can buy mounts and stuff, but like it's not as plug and play as uh as you know it could be by taking the entire engine and transmission out of the honda um and swapping it over i'm trying to retain as many factory parts as possible so that when i break it uh it's easy enough to replace and parts will be plentiful and available in junkyards um for years to come right right now fiero parts are coming uh, few and far between. I slid into a curb in the snow in my Fiero and was lucky to find a new front spindle, you know, 80 miles away from me. I could go pick up, but if that wasn't the case, it would be, you know, scouring junkyards across the country trying to find one. Goals for the car is to, uh, right, short term and long term, um, right, we're looking at like a minimum viable product for what this car could be and that is running driving competing in autocross you know cruising back roads 240 horsepower is going to be more than enough for that uh at least for the first six months and then we can look at building a j35 uh to handle boost and maybe get up to like 400 450 that seems like plenty of power in the chassis uh, i'm really going to spend my time dialing in the suspension uh, obviously moving suspension components, you could really screw up the car's dynamics, calculating anti-dive, trying to get a good roll center, 
Um, and, you know, negative camber gain on roll is going to be really important to me and spend a bunch of time on that as I figure out how to, uh, to stuff it in there. If you followed along to this point, I really appreciate it. Hit that like and subscribe button. Next time we're going through, we're going to talk about the interfaces, uh, fuel system, and what it's going to take to support this J-Series engine, and then start looking at suspension and how to engineer that.